about prayer. I was wondering if you could show us um, or show me um, what the Bible says about prayer. Why should we pray? What does praying do? And what's the proper way to yeah, pray? Yeah, you want me to spend three hours on ask, answering that question? I mean, <laughs> the basic response to prayer is that's how you have intimate communion with God, correct? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm thinking so. Well, how do you talk to God? By prayer. Prayer means intimate communion with God. So there is no intimacy with God that doesn't include praying to God, speaking to God, acknowledging God. It's prayer. It's a covenant relationship. It's like husband and wife or parents and children. That's the imagery given in Scripture. If you keep ignoring your father or your spouse, then what you're telling your father or your spouse is you don't care for them. You don't acknowledge them. You're disrespecting them. Therefore, you don't love them. If there isn't an intimate communication, intimate, personal communion and fellowship, then that means what you're basically saying is you have no interest to have relationship with God. You only cry out to God when necessary, when you have needs, meaning that you're being selfish. So that's the essential reason why we pray, to be connected to God, to have fellowship with God, communion with God, and another reason why we pray is to discipline ourselves. These are spiritual exercises and disciplines. Because Paul talks about the Christian life as discipline, as training. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. The more you train spiritually, the stronger you become, the healthier you become spiritually. Because we're accustomed to the flesh and the things of the flesh. It is unnatural to do the things of the spirit. But we have to come to the point where that becomes natural. Do the things of the spirit and things of the flesh become unnatural. So that requires discipline. It's like training. It's like exercise. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. So when Catholics or Orthodox have wrote prayer, when they say, well, why do you do it repetitively? It's because this is the way of training yourself and building up your spiritual muscles. It's like going to the gym and doing chest one day, back one day, doing the same exercise over and over again. So there is a twofold aspect. It is discipline to become stronger spiritually so you that you succumb to the flesh less and less and submit to the spirit more and more. And it's your way of being intimately connected and having intimate fellowship with God who loves you. Those are the two main aspects among many. But again, it will require a series for me to go through that. But that's yeah, no, but you speak the truth. That's exactly what I've, I've experienced. Thank when you, I buddy. pray more. Thank you. I grow closer to God and he answers my prayers Thank more you. effectively. I and when I don't, I go away. Thank you when you, you speak the, so I speak the truth, because if you said I was speaking lie, then that means I must be lying because you're the standard, Kay. True. Here's what they taught. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Jesus is the logos. Greek logos can mean reason or word within God. He is the reason of God within God because God has always existed with reason. He's never existed without reason, right? Okay. That reason, Logos, is who becomes Jesus. He's within God, uncreated, because God has always existed with his Logos and never existed without it. Likewise, the Spirit being his divine breath, God has always existed with his breath, never existed without it. So the reason and the breath exist within God before creation. That means they're uncreated, right? If they're with God before creation, correct? Correct. Okay. So when God was reasoning within himself, having communion within himself, he was reasoning with his logos and by extension, the spirit. This is what they understood. So then they believed that when God wanted to create, this is their understanding. So when God wanted to create creation from nothing, he summoned the reason that was in his mind, divine mind, summoned that reason out of his mind, what they would say out of his heart. Remember, God is spirit. So when you say heart and mind, you're not talking about physical, right? I understand. Okay, an analog, analogy, analogy, analogous. All right, anyway. So the reason comes out from God's mind or his bosom and heart. And that act of bringing forth out of himself the reason, that's the act of begetting. So he comes out of God, doesn't separate from God. And that act of him coming out is the moment when you can call him the son. He becomes the son. But that's before creation. So the word springs forth, that act is springing forth, but he's now still inseparable from God. And then the spirit is breathed out 
So here now you can see the differentiation that was within God. But now you see, because they're coming out of God without separating from God before creation. And then God uses the word and the spirit to create. Mm. Is that like a specific Bible passage to like? Yeah, they would appeal to Marvel. verses where, yeah, Psalm 45, they believe that referred to it. Proverbs 8, 22. Job 33, 4, that's how they understood the language of these texts. But these texts are showing that the reason of God, the word of God, the wisdom of God, the breath of God, are eternal to God, uncreated, and from God, not from creation. This is where they're not getting it. Creation means to be created out of nothing or from that which is created. So you're created because you came from created things that came out of nothing, right? right okay. That's not what they taught about Jesus and the Spirit. None of them taught that. I have their writings. I've read their writings. I've done sessions on them, quoted them in context. They taught that the word and the spirit, being the breath of God and the reason of God, are eternal to God, uncreated, because they've always been a part of God. Part, you know, remember, we're using an analog analogous language because God is not physical. He doesn't have parts. Yeah. So that there was no time in eternity God existed apart from his word and breath, his spirit. So they're lying to you. Makes sense. Makes sense. So they're lying to you. Do not be deceived. Are you with me there? Yeah, yeah. Now let me get you the articles. I got too many. This is why if you go to my blog, you just put in Church Fathers or here. If you just put in Justin Martin, I'm going to show you what comes up. I've done sessions, put in Justin Martin or even the articles here. Justin Martyr. I even did one with Jay Dyer and with William Albrecht. Okay. I'm going to show you the link here. You just put in justin martyr in my search engine and here's what you find so brother do not be deceived now i don't blame you because when i first encountered joe's witnesses they too misquoted the fathers and misled me and i thought wow so the first christian saw jesus as a creature glory to god for these men of god who studied the fathers and when i found their writings i saw they were lying glory to god that he raises up his true servants to expose these liars and i pray we are all his true servants now you see, I gave you the link, guys. All you do is put in Justin Martin. Watch what's going to pop up. I'm going to show you on my screen. You ready? You go study them, okay, so you don't be deceived again. Understood. You sure? Yeah, so I'll do watch. Work. watch it. <laughs> okay. See, I just put in Justin Martin. Look what came up. See that? Mm -hmm. More on Justin Martin's crusade. And when you click on the article, here's another thing. You scroll down. And guess what you find? Look at all the articles I link to. In every article, I link to other articles. So what do you, what I link to? Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr, nameless God. Justin Martyr's witness to Christ's essential eternal de deity. So if you click there, this is the article where I show you that Justin Martyr, what he taught about Jesus. He taught that Jesus is Jehovah of hosts, the God that appeared in the Old Testament because it wasn't the Father, and that he is begotten before creation that means he's not created right now let me show you another thing now put in tertullian uh let's see what you get when you put in tertullian you guys you see how you use the search engine just put in a word trinity holy spirit and read just put in the word now watch here now i'm going to put in tertullian are you ready he's not a father he was an apologist but they cite him too. Now watch here, Tertullian. Uh-huh. You listening, brother? And I'll let you ask your next question. I'll get to you. I don't know how to pronounce your name. You there, brother? I can't hear you. The guy leave? What happened this dude? Dude, are you there? Yeah, he left. Okay, guys, you see how that works? All right. You see how that works? Now here, you go to Tertullian. Watch what you find. I guess he left. Okay. Tertullian, right? Tertullian and Mary's virginity. Tertullian of Carthage on infant baptism. Okay. Did Tertullian deny the eternal nature of Christ? You guys see that? Just put in the words. You see that article? You bury Chris Salad in his dressing. All right? There you go. There's more. Tertullian and the doctrine of the Trinity. It's there, brethren, free. I want to thank the Lord Jesus for all of you. Again, I mean it. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Lord.
Because if it wasn't for Lord stirring your hearts to contribute financially for me to do full-time ministry, I couldn't find these quotations and produce these articles. So Lord bless you and thank you. Pray my support, stay steady until I die and finish the race with integrity and not be a fake. Thank you, brethren. Because of you, I'm able to write these articles. Because of you, I can gather these quotes. So you don't have to find the writings. Search the quotes there, and it's yours. Take them, upload them, translate them, clip them. But ask the Spirit to help you understand the arguments and share them accurately. But you got to share them. Okay, Hello. good. Praise God. So you left atheism. Now you know the true God. What's going on? And so I, was, I first started with the New Testament. I read, I, did not, I read the three Gospels. Part of Acts, then I went to try and read the Old Testament. Good My problem is when I read the Old Testament, it seems like that they are two, they are not the same, they don't have the same character. Like no, the character in Jesus. You're, you're coming to the faith, you're a babe in the faith, you don't still understand God's nature and how the Old and New Testaments are consistent. So it's going to take time for you to grow. You just came to the faith out of atheism. You don't expect to understand the Bible overnight. It's going to take a lifelong of intense study, meditation, and seeking the Spirit to sanctify you. So obviously when you read the Old Testament, you're not going to understand it because you're going to see things that in your mind may be incompatible with the character of Jesus or shock you because you can't believe that these things can be attributed to God. We all go through that phase. Everyone goes through that phase. But the more you study, the more you pray, the more you meditate, God then gives you wisdom, and then you finally understand, oh, now I see. But that's going to take time, brother. It's not going to happen overnight. You know how many sessions I've done on Old Testament passages that people have problems with? Like, how could God order that everything that breathes be wiped out? And then showing what it means and it doesn't mean and showing the justice of God. It's going to take time, process. You're not going to get it overnight. When a baby is born, do you give it steak and potatoes? No. So you're a spiritual baby. You're now suffocating because you're stuffing yourself with meat and potatoes. So what does the Bible say about you here? First Peter 2, verses 1 to 2, but we're going to read all the way to 3, right? First Peter 2, verses 1 to 2, but we're going to read all the way to 3. You're a baby, man. You just came out of atheism. Glory to God. Now you know God exists, and the true God is the God revealed in Jesus. But you're a baby. So in First Timothy 2, verses 1 to 3, Therefore, laying aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, you're a baby, you're on milk. You're now going and you want meat and you want pizza. I love pizza and ice cream, but if I give it to you, you're going to die. So how should how do you advise how do you advise me to start the how to read? Well, if the Old Testament is problematic because you don't understand it, then for now just read the New Testament over and over again until you fully understood the character of Christ and know that Jesus is real, He's alive, and that the Gospels give you the actual life of Jesus and. It tells you how the church was established and what you need to know. Just learn the New Testament. Find a solid church that is ancient. Because if you came out of atheism, you need to get baptized. And you need to attend church regularly. And then when you have grown to fall in love with Christ, then you go back to the Old Testament. And then there are sessions. I've done in others. But I would recommend you watch all the sessions I've done in the Old Testament. But you're young now. Old Testament would be too much. I'm telling you, when I first came to the faith and I read the Old Testament, I was shocked too. But you know what saved me? You know what saved me? No. I knew Jesus is real. I knew Jesus is alive. I knew that Jesus is not dead. I knew Jesus is almighty. I knew the Bible is his word. And I knew that Jesus is beautiful and holy and righteous. So... I took him at his word and I trusted him, even in areas where I couldn't understand. When you humble yourself and you come with that attitude, the Lord then will bless you with wisdom. You don't say, wow, how can this be God? This can't be God. Okay, God says, all right. Is that what you think? Then I'll hand you over to your desires. But if you say, God, I know you're beautiful. 
I know you're righteous. I know you're good. I know you're merciful. I know you're loving. I know you're real. These passages are confusing me because I don't understand how they reflect your goodness. But I know it's your word, so I'm going to trust you and wait for the answer. And he'll give you the answer. He gave it to me. But I waited. I didn't get overnight. And when, when he gave me the answer, I'm promising, I'm letting you know, I was blown away. Wow. Now I understand. 